what is up everybody welcome back it's not thursday but it is friday we had a little i had a little uh coaching debut for my softball girl so i couldn't make it the other day uh but we are jumping in we're gonna go into episode five kind of top or six whatever we're at uh talking about you know adp startup some targets, some fades. We're going to be going through kind of our process, as you can see on the screen if you're watching this on YouTube or if you're watching this on um, on X or whatever you want to call it. Uh, but and then we're going to be talking about actual go through ADP. So what we're going to be diving into is uh, kind of a, um, ADP uh, from Adeco site. It's called Dynasty Data Lab, and we're going to be kind of going through what we're seeing right now. It's pre-free agency ADP, but I think still has pockets, and we're going to be able to talk about these type of strategies here. Uh, so I'm here with Leo Pasiga. So we're going to just dive into it, and, and you're going to talk about kind of, I thought it'd be good to kind of talk about startup strategy, what you have here, your tiers, and kind of how you go through that. Yeah, I'm looking forward to diving in and, and talking about this stuff. So one of the things that I always I always try to do when I do a startup is make sure that I have that plan. We've talked about it in every episode we've done so far, have a blueprint, kind of have an idea of where you want to go. And, mm -hmm. and I think this is a good illustration of exactly what you should be, the mental gymnastics you should be doing, because too yeah. often times I think folks, you know, they know where they're picking like they have the seventh pick. So they kind of play out the first round in their head. And then, all right, I kind of know who's going to be available in the second, get a player in their head. And then all of a sudden that player is gone and they're thrown for a loop. Okay. Well, I was really going to start with these two. This was going to be my strategy. How did I miss out in the second round? I got sniped. What's my backup plan? So like with everything we talk about, it's, it's, just fundamentals and muscle memory and kind of getting in the habit, whether you're doing a mock, whether you're doing a startup, just doing that muscle memory so that you're ready to go and you're ready to have a plan and pivot and, and go in whatever direction you need to. So basically it starts off, you can see it on the screen, it starts off with my targets, right? And that's kind of what I just said. We go into that first, you know, in the first round where you're going to pick and you're going to have a pretty good idea just based on ADP, who's going to be available. If you're picking third, you know, it's easy, right? You only have to worry about two guys going off the board first. If you're yeah. picking eighth, a little different, got to kind of factor in, okay, this is going to be based on ADP. Here's who's going to be available. How do I want to kind of build my team? And then you just, it's the first couple rounds, obviously you can kind of plan out. This really becomes a tool that, that shows its merit as you get further into the draft and, you know, more and more mm -hmm. strategy has to get uh, inputted into this, you know, into the, into your roster build as you're drafting. But uh, let's, let's go through, let's talk about it and, and, mm -hmm. you know, let's kind of map out how this would work. Yeah. And I think it's important, like, you know, we use this ADP this year, me and uh, I have a co-manager. We started kind of like a co it's a, it's a crazy league, but we, we, we did it together. And this is exactly what we did. This is a strategy we implemented. So the the draft's still going because it's one of those things that it's just taking 75 days. Like it's going way too long, but we've been doing this and, and the, my targets and the players, how we identify it. We kind of go through there. Um, and then as we go, we've adjusted, you know, we, you have to pivot and you do those things, but I think it is a good point. Understanding kind of where that is. You have to like, I know a lot of guys are going to startups without going, well, okay, where's that ADP at? Where is this at? They're just kind of winging it. Um, and that's not a, that's not a plan. Um, having a plan and going through there. Um, so we talked about this. We say, hey, here's our targets, must-haves, or wants. We've done this in other episodes, like how we build and what we like there and stuff like that. Um, so when you're looking at my targets, you know, I'll, I'll start in terms of just me, uh, in terms of like, you know, I'm looking for that top quarterback if it's super flex. Like, okay, can I get that guy that I'm looking at? But with that top quarterback, there are tiers, right? And I think that there is a true tier right now after QB eight, nine. Like if you're looking at top QB, so going into it, my targets will change as soon as like it hits that. Now, where do you put like a guy like Justin Jefferson, CD Lamb, Jamar Chase within that tier? Like is that is a, is a guy like Anthony Richardson must have over Justin Jefferson? Or when do you start looking at, okay, the talent outweighs kind of what I want, that player, that target I have. So I do think when you're looking at my targets, you do have to have that tier base within the my targets. Okay, if these guys are on the board, this is where this ADP is at. And again, we're going to show you that ADP. We're going to show you that, um, that website you can go to. If these two guys are here, if Joe Burrow, Justin Jefferson is here, who do I want? Who's that must have target here? And then later, if I'm going to build out, how do I find that? But that's how I look at the my target stuff. Like these guys I want. Yes, I absolutely want Justin Jefferson. But how does the format outweigh that? Do I want Joe Burrow over that or however you do divvy it up? 
Yeah, so exactly. And I think the tears is important. And, you know, whether we're talking about it on on Twitter with a bunch of the other analysts that are out there, tears seems to be the topic of conversation and a lot of the interactions that I'm having. And it really is the, the way to go. What what I the analogy I'll make with this particular with these layers is like when you go to the optometrist and they put that that goggles on you to test your eyes and they say, tell me what's better now or now, and they flip the different lenses over your eyes. And that's kind of what this is to me, right? And it's every single pick, once I get out of the first round, I really apply this. So, right, my targets, this is who I'd like to have in this round. Then it's like, okay, well, who should be available in this round, right? So then it's kind of like now, instead of having just a guy that I want to pick, now I have, now I have, four above him and four below him based on that round and that pick. So it gives me a pretty good idea of who should be available. Yeah. Then it's the next filter. Okay. Well, who's dropping who all of a sudden should have been a third round pick. And now I'm at the end of the fourth. So I didn't plan on this. That wasn't who I expected to be here based on ADP. So now that's another lens. Okay. This value Mm -hmm. is dropping. How does that change my selection? So those first three boxes kind of work together. My targets who I've identified going in, ADP, who should be available within that range, you know, what tiers are available within that range where I'd like to go. And then, okay, well, who's disrupted that by by coming off the board early? And now there's available value that's actually dropping. So all of those Mm -hmm. three kind of get meshed in together to figure out where I'm going to go next. Yep. And I'll, I'll give you an example. So, you know, in this draft, and I always, I, you know, Leo's going to be your big picture guy. I'm going to give a little bit of examples in here. Cause that's kind of where I, um, I like to thrive too, in terms of player talk, uh, a guy like that, that happened in our, the league that we're drafting in. So this is, you know, when we're trying to do content, I, I always try to do like what I would do. I'm not going to tell you to go buy a player that I'm not going to buy just for clicks. And I'm not going to, we're not going to give you strategy that we don't use. So in this draft, you know, we went really heavy in terms of the quarter, you know, the quarterbacks, you know, we, we grabbed CJ and Dak Prescott as our two quarterbacks and we trade a lot of picks here. Um, but we were sitting there and, you know, a player that neither one of us really likes was Kyron Williams. And this was pre free agency. So there was still stuff that could have happened or whatever. Um, and we were looking at it. We're like, man, I just don't like Kyron Williams, but he fell to five Oh three. And he's our running back two behind Brees Hall. And we were kind of like, at this point, based on his ADP, where he's dropping at, those are the targets that. Now, we didn't identify him as must-haves. We actually said, we don't want, right? But then at a certain point, that ADP slipped enough to where it's like, all right, you know what? Our build dictates win now. We have Brees, and now we're going to have Kyron Williams there together. If Kyron can bounce Hey, and he has that top five season again. Him and Brees Hall, that could be that could win your league right there together. Those two guys, they stay healthy. So we looked at it as, you know what? You know, his fall is predicated. Like, the, it's, for example, the two guys that run around him, Zay Flowers went before him and then DJ Moore right after. Based on just value, I'd say Kyron Williams right there, the volume that he's going to get. So that's what happens there, too. So, you, like, we didn't have Kyron on our big board at all. We built out a big board before we drafted. He wasn't there at all, but sometimes it dictates that. You have to pivot. You have to go there, and value based on ADP is a huge thing that people, I don't think, jump at. I think, and especially with how the teams are getting built. Every team in your league is building through the wide receiver position. Every single team. It doesn't matter. Like They're all doing that. So sometimes you do have to pivot a little bit, and that's why we grabbed Hall and Kyron Williams, and I think that that's a, that's a good duo for us as we build this roster out. Right. I think that's a perfect example, especially if you were in the fifth and he's had got a fourth round, early fourth round ADP. Well, now all of a sudden he comes in on that lens that you drop in and and now you have to consider. And that kind of leads yeah. us to the next two two boxes on this graph. You know, some of the things to apply because you're talking the first three are really talking about player values, who you really yeah. want, what ADP, what tier, what value slipping. Now you're kind of adding the context layer. OK, well how is my roster building out? And he's becoming more prevalent. The further, the deeper you get into the draft, this becomes more you know, important because you're talking yeah. now about positional needs. You're talking about a roster weakness. You're talking about um, you know, talent that's available um, against your roster and against other rosters that are being built through this draft. And, and that all kind of matters. And then it once you kind of weigh that, 
how your roster construction is going and what strategy you're applying, then it's okay. Is there another strategy that's available? Like, let's say all of a sudden, you know, the running back value is dropping like crazy because the other 11 teams in your league are doing exactly what you said. They're building solely around wide receivers. And all of a sudden the running back value is, is amazing. You're still going to need to build out wide receivers at some point, but you want to capitalize on the running backs that are available, the value that's available. So now your strategy pivots yeah. because you planned on building around wide receiver. It's just not there based on how the draft is playing out. So make your team strong in another area. That's where the last two boxes really come into play. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, one thing we identified very early. So, and to your credit, we did the same thing. A lot of guys are going youth, right? So we kind of looked at it and said, you know what, you know, based on our team, if we get Kyron in the fifth round, we're definitely going to be able to get some veteran guys later. So, and this is pre-free agency. So we grabbed Derek Henry in the 12th round at the end of the 12th round as our running back, you know, we're looking at a four or five, um, you know, DeAndre Hopkins, we got in the 15th round. So like, these are guys that were like, Hey, you know, as they kind of went, we're going to fill needs. Now I will say this, now this is where I'm interested to talk about this. So in this draft, it's, it's tied in premium. It's 1.5 five tight end premium. It's not a huge premium. We had Dalton Kincaid. We got redrafted Dalton Kincaid, but it's already through 18th round. And we have not taken another tight end too. And most people would be like worried about that. They'd be stressing about that. But for us, when we're looking at the board, it's like the best tight end left is Dawson Knox. And do we take Dawson Knox or, and this is a real draft happening now, or we just took Singletary who could be the running back one for the New York Giants next year. And it's like, that is kind of how you look at it. You don't over, I don't think you have to reach on positions either. If you're comfortable just taking that hit a little bit. And to be honest with you, if we lost Dalton Kincaid, we're going to go out and trade for a tight end anyway. We're probably not going to be putting in the tight end two that we're drafting in the 18th round. We're going to have to be active on the trade market anyway. So we kind of looked at that and said, you know what? Let's take a shot on Singletary. We don't love Singletary, but again, it's all about that positional value and how you how you kind of go through there. Um, you know, do you agree with that? Do you think you have to draft your does it just depend probably context based on the league and how it's going? Yes. Yeah, I think I think how you handled it was exactly how you should handle it. Sometimes you have yeah. to punt a position based on value that's on the board. And we talk about not having the perfect lineup in in May. It really holds true in a startup draft. You're going to have, especially one that's taking place this early, you're yeah. going to have the entire summer to make moves. And so if you can stockpile depth at a different position and take advantage of the value that's on the board, that'll give you trading chips as the summer goes on to fill in the needs that you have uh, yeah. on your roster, you know, again, so you, we talk about uh, in every show that we've done, we've talked about the variance, we've talked about identifying it. And when that value drops, you're mitigating any loss or any risk of failure. You're mitigating that at the tight end position by drafting value at another position. So mm -hmm. you, you know, you should be, you should never worry about leaving a startup draft. You should work. Let's put it this way. You should worry about leaving a startup draft with the most available talent you can get regardless yeah. of position. Now it's nice to leave with a well-rounded roster. It's nice to leave feeling that you don't have any immediate needs, but ultimately building the most value, even with gaps in, in, in definite, black holes on your roster is still okay because yeah. this it doesn't end you're not going you're not going into the season with that roster you're going to make changes so i think that's the ideal way to look at it and always try to get as much value as you possibly can regardless of that need on your position now if you have to start four wide receivers and you're punting the wide receiver position that's a little bit different story yeah right it's a little the positional value has a little bit different weight to it simply because you have to start four. So league requirements and, and starting requirements matter to some degree as to how you weight the position. But, um, you know, in a normal league with, with normal starting requirements, punting the position is fine. Yeah. And I, and I think it is too. I think when you're looking at it overall, you know, sometimes again, we talk about it all the time, you're not filling your team in May, you're not, or March or April, whatever you're doing, you're collecting value as much as possible. Um, I think it's hard. I think the later rounds is where I really want to identify it. So we're going to go through players in a minute. Um, but 
like it's it's harder though like everybody's invested in those first 10 rounds everybody loves it like they're all invested in that and then as you go you see the clock it's going okay now it's six hours till the next pick and those type of things because over time like you know i'm in some leagues with 35 round raw you know dynasty startups like that's a mm-hmm. long dynasty so there is times where i think guys look at the roster they're in the 17th round oh i need a tight end too i'll just take best available because i'm gonna make this pick don't do that Look at the ADP, the value, what is there, and then you go. You have plenty of time right now. It is March. Don't let that annoying league mate that you have that keeps saying, on the clock, on the clock, um, like, don't let him bother you. Like, you just look and just don't fill a gap. Like, I know plenty of people look at the roster, and they see, like, oh, two, one tight end or four running backs. And if you don't need to necessarily address that position – based on league settings and scoring, don't rush to do it. You know, that's what this is for here. Kind of adjust. And you should be doing this based on every round. Like as we have on the screen there, third round, this is what I'm going for. Fourth round, this is what I'm going for. Fifth, as it goes, I think that's incredibly important because you could drop them down into boxes. Okay. Hey, they're still here. I'm doing those type of things. Having that spreadsheet open is is entirely important um, for your startup. So before we get into the players, do you have anything else in terms of this strategy, what you're trying to like build here? The only thing I would add, because I think we've covered, done a decent job covering this, is just the other roster builds in your league matter too. So, you know, you're paying attention to your roster, you're applying this lens to how you're drafting, but knowing what's what your league mates are looking for, and especially how they're drafting. Sometimes it's kind of, you know, you mentioned just now talking about the person that, you know, sees a sees a hole in their roster for tight end two and they grab it. If that's how they're drafting, if they did that mm-hmm. with a third quarterback, if they did that with a third wide receiver, if they're plugging in those drafting based on roster needs, you can kind of get an idea where they may go. And especially if you're picking, if they're picking two picks in front of you at either on either side, that can be a little bit of an um, important piece of information as you're starting to plan out your team. So pay attention to how they're filling their rosters, what they're prioritizing. So you get an idea, just again, the strategies they're implementing. So I think that's valuable too. Yeah. And a hundred percent. And the last thing I'll say to this and we'll move on is, you know, as they go, as people make picks and they get upset that like you got their guy or like, cause some will tip their picks and they'll say, Oh, that was my guy. You sniped me, whatever. Mark that down. Note it. Hey, this guy, these guys like this player because you can extract some value later. Like you can definitely kind of go through 100%. there and, and it's important. And that's why I never do it. I used to do it when I was early on. Oh, you snipe me just to kind of create that camaraderie in the group or whatever. Mm-hmm. But I don't want people to know what I wanted. Like, I'm not, oh, okay. Like, for example, I mean, this is a show or whatever, so I'll just say it. Like, in that draft where we took Singletary, we wanted Bucky Irving, the rookie running back out of Oregon. He went at 16-12, so we grabbed Singletary at 17-3. You know, we're not going to say anything about Bucky. We're not going to use that as like, a, oh, man, I wish we'd have had him dialed up or whatever in the queue. Um, but that is a player definitely if he struggles, maybe he doesn't get drafted. Well, we might be able to go get later and attack that. It won't cost us more because that guy knows that we want him now. Like there, there, there's little strategies you can implement in your drafts when you do that stuff. Agree. A hundred percent. All right, let's jump over. So I do want to show us everybody this now, if you don't, if you don't know what this is, um, it's a very, very good, you know, data ADP. It's free for this. Now he does have a website. I think his name's Adeko. I always mess it up. I'm sorry. At A D E I K O F F. Um, and he created amazing tools, website, all of this stuff. What we are showing is the free stuff. So I'm not showing anything behind a paywall. You can pay. I think it's five bucks a month. It's probably worth the money. Um, but I did want to show you his ADP tool. So what we're going to kind of look at is what we just talked about, kind of building it out. And you could do this for free. Like you're not, you don't have to buy anything else and just kind of go through it. So what I did, and I, again, don't, you know, all you people out there watching, watching this, not listening to it, you're going to see my very poor like cropping skills. But I went through and I kind of try to go through four or five rounds of where ADP is at. The nice thing, the cool thing about this ADP is it shows you kind of where the picks are getting taken right now. So the picks are inserted to show you rookie value. So for example, when you're looking at this, you know, basically pick 101 is going 12th overall. So when you're thinking of like, what's, what's Caleb Williams value in Superflex right now? Well, he's kind of sitting there around Jamar Chase, um, possibly Garrett Wilson, Jameer Gibbs in that range. So just to give you an idea of where these rookie picks are going. Now, a lot of leagues are either drafting with rookies included 
or they have the picks there. So this kind of help you, gives you ADP of where they're at, where are they going, who's going to be there. Those type of things I think are interesting in terms of where their value is at. Um, and it's across the board in terms of where, where that looks at. So when you're looking at this, you know, overall, like you're thinking those tiers and where everybody's at. I think the thing to point out is like Bijan Robinson, kind of where he is going, um, ranked 15th or 14th, 15th in that range. He's a running back one. Not a ton of running backs, though, in those first five rounds. Like when you're looking at it, really, there's eight running backs being taken in the first five rounds, generally speaking. That's it. So just understanding where that value is at. You're going to get value later at the running back position. Well, okay, let's look at team build. How can I build my team out here at this ADP? Um, I think it's a really good tool. We're going we're to work our way through these drafts to kind of see that. Um, but does anything stand out, either player-wise, which I know you love. You love talking about individual players with no context. I know that. <laughs> um, or just you know, the tool at all, or like, or I mean, we never really talked about this. Like how comfortable are you drafting rookies? Like in, in startup drafts, like, are you a veteran guy? Like you're going to more go towards lead toward veterans. Or are you okay building like, Hey, Caleb Williams is my QB one. I'm okay. Building around him. Where are you at with that strategy? It really comes down to the conviction I have in, in that rookie player. Do okay. I really believe in that rookie? And if I do, then, you know what, then I'm comfortable because I think for the most part in a solid rookie class, this is pretty indicative of where they fall in a normal startup. I don't think mm -hmm. we're seeing anything outlandish um, really, uh, you know, based on, on what's on the screen. I think what's really interesting about the first slide that you put up and it, and it goes strictly back to how you started the show talking about tiers, because you can see where Joe Burrow and Justin Jefferson, where that break is, right? Quarterback yeah. six and then wide receiver one. So it is so important to have those tiers set up so that you're prepared for what that looks like, because you don't want to look at it and say, okay, the first six picks have been quarterbacks. I've got to get a quarterback. You want to be driven by what's the tier break. And, you know, where's my value? Is my value in having a top three wide receiver or is my value having walking away and having the seventh or eighth ranked quarterback, you know, on my roster? So I think that's critical. And I think this is a great visual of how it's so easy to get roped into the pressure of feeling like you have to leave because I'm guilty of that. You know, yeah. early on when I started playing Superflex, it was so important to me to leave with a quarterback, you know, out of the first round. Sometimes I would reach at the back of the first just so I would have that comfort level of I've got my quarterback. And it's just a terrible way to draft your team. And you learn through trial yeah. and error. And yeah. so, again, I think this is critical because you can see first six picks, quarterbacks, all green. So now where's my tear break? And with everything that's happened recently with the Chargers over the court, again, this is before free agency, but, you know, with everything, with all the talk about Justin Herbert and what that's going to look like in that Charger offense, I'd be much more comfortable leaning into the top three wide receivers at, at mm -hmm. that one seven position than I would be reaching for that quarterback. Uh, yeah, hundred percent. That's why you do it, right? You're looking at the tiers of where it's at, and you're right. Like, I think the context with what they're going on with the Chargers, like maybe you feel like, and again, I, I'd be interested in what his ADP is in a couple weeks. Well, obviously, it's going to kind of change a little bit. Um, I, I wouldn't shock me to see Caleb Williams and Anthony Richardson jump ahead, especially with what the Chicago Bears just did in terms of adding um, Keenan Allen. Now, you know, possibly adding whatever they're going to add at one on one. Um, with Caleb and then 109, excuse me, maybe they go tackle. They're probably going to go tackle out of Oregon State. But, you know, look at what they built around them. Maybe you're sitting there like, I, I'm more comfortable with Caleb, what they're building, than Justin Herbert, which is crazy to sh say. But based on the context and the building, I, I part of me believes the thing with the Chargers, and I know this isn't, you know, really on topic, but I don't care. I, That's like, fine. I, I do. <laughs> Telesco has done a did a terrible job building that squad. So when you're looking at the moves, they're they're gonna have to eat some cap. They're gonna have to eat the moves that they had to make. A fourth round pick for Keenan Allen is actually not a bad deal. Like I think in reality, with all that money that was coming off of that deal, that's fine. I think that the Chargers will build a solid roster around Herbert. And and the the crazy theories I see out there. There is nine, 0.001 chance they move on from Herbert. I think the dead cap is $124 million or something like that um, if they try to move him. There's no way Harbaugh took that job and was like, oh, yeah, I don't want Justin Herbert. That is crazy talk. That's the reason why he took that job. But I do think that they're going to build that inside out like all his teams are. Offensive line, defensive line strength. We're going to see that. 
obviously they're going to have a very good running game. I do think that's a prevalence, but he's also a very smart coach. He understands where his, his, his money is going to be made at the, at the quarterback position with Herbert. I think he's going to be more efficient. Maybe not this year. I don't know if Herbert's going to have that year where you're like, oh my gosh. But I do think that there could be a dip period with Justin Herbert this next year where you're really buying because I think that moving forward with Harbaugh, he's going to be an excellent quarterback, even in fantasy. I, I think that you're going to see that. So I think that's going to be very cognitive dynasty drafters. If you're going to start a startup, most wait till after the NFL draft. If you do that, I do think Herbert's going to be a heck of a value probably at the back end of the first or early second if that's where his ADP drops. Um, I'll be surprised if it drops that low, but it could. I think it could probably 110 is probably QB 10 is probably where I'd, I'd expect him to kind of fall to. Um, but there is definitely a there's a tier there. And yes, I'd be very much comfortable with Justin Jefferson and those guys, I think, when you're looking at build. But I do think Herbert might fall in that kind of Murray range from last year. So there's there's value to be had. Even Kyle Murray is sitting there as a uh, you know, quarterback. 10 to 12 in that range. That's a pretty fun quarterback to build your fantasy roster around, around Justin Jefferson and CeeDee Lamb. Like, if you want to go wide receiver quarterback, I love pairing him with Kyler Murray in that same stage. Yeah, the another thing that I was I was kind of surprised about was Jordan Love uh, coming off the board at quarterback nine, according to this data. I know that he, you know, we've talked about it before, having finished a year kind of a dynasty darling based on, yeah. on the strong finish he had. But I, I was surprised that he, you know, in, in this particular data, he leapfrogged Kyler and Trevor. I thought maybe he would um, still be behind both of them uh, coming in at, you know, quarterback 11 instead of quarterback nine. So I was a little mm -hmm. bit surprised by that. Yeah, it's happening, though. I mean, there there is a very strong... It's the data guys, and I don't want to, you know, the analytics guys, they love Jordan Love. So they're definitely pushing those Jordan Love up. Past Kyler, past, you know, Lawrence and all that. I, I struggle with that personally. I'd rather have, I think that they're safer. You know, I, I get what they've trying to do. I, I understand what the Packers are kind of bringing in, um, you know, Jacob doing all those things. Like I get that. Um, but I'm with you on that. I, I, I don't know. I, that position makes me feel like I'd rather like, I'd really rather just go Murray Lawrence trade back a little bit. Like there's other ways to kind of do that. I would be worried if Jordan Love was my QB one. If he's QB two, that's fine. Like I've seen guys pair hurts and love together. Okay. All right. I get it. Like if you're going to go to the upside, I'm um, at the one, two spot, but if love is your QB one, I still struggle with that. The upside, the safety net, those type of things. He kind of reminds you of Brock Purdy a little bit in terms of dynasty. Don't yell at me out there for all you NFL guys. Like just that. Eh, I like him. I like Purdy, I, but they're kind of tied to their head coach. That system. Are they going to build around them? What type of things? Now I, he's going to get his contract because it, it is what it is. Like when you're looking at Green Bay, the, the QB market, all of that stuff. But I just, I'm concerned about that. I don't know how many championships you are going to be able to win with Jordan Love as your QB one. The the one thing I'll add based on our conversation and what we're talking about here, uh, a possible strategy that you might be able to implement is basically punting the quarterback position from a, mm -hmm. from a from a little bit of a standpoint. I mean, obviously in Superflex, you don't want to kick it to the curb completely, but thinking about how slow Justin Herbert may start off this coming season, uh, you know, and especially if he goes, you know, in the first round where he went in with this ADP, if he were to go uh, in that particular slot, there may be enough disappointment that he could be the prime target to go after maybe week five or week six. Mm -hmm. And you obviously in super flex, you're going to pay a lot for a quarterback regardless, but he may be, if you, if you kind of punt your quarterback strategy, kind of wait on it and fill up your other positions first, and then kind of go journeyman quarterback or whatever in the fifth or sixth round, um, Herbert's somebody that you could potentially go after week five or week six in, in the upcoming season to, put yourself in a great position heading into 2025. Yeah, especially if you do that productive struggle. We, we talked about it in the last episode, that productive struggle mm -hmm. build. He might be a quarterback to do that with this year. Yep. Like, hey, I'm going to go productive struggle with Herbert. Um, and I love the fact that you brought that up because the, the, about the you should really identify some guys that mostly at the quarterback, probably a little bit of the wide receiver, maybe tight end. Tight end is another position you could do this, where you could identify some guys that are definitely going to probably – just based on a historical, you know, record and everything that we know about these guys, they're going to struggle maybe a little bit out of the gate or new offense. Okay. Who's in a new offense who might struggle there, you know, landing spot, free agency, maybe knocked down a little bit, 
who's going to lose some value, but they're talented enough to bring him back. Trey McBride was a perfect example from last year, the tight end out of Arizona. You know, Trey McBride, I mean, I saw some very, very smart dynasty analysts of saying Trey McBride's a bust, right? Like after one year, he's a bust. I'm done with him. I'm not going to go there. Now he's sitting there as tight end two slash three, possibly. And last year, you know, in the beginning of the year, even in the offseason, you could have got Trey McBride pretty cheap. Like he was a very cheap guy there. Even like a guy like Kyle Pitts right now, I think is still getting valued kind of low, as we know, with Kirk Cousins and those guys going there too. So identifying in this stuff, using this ADP and stuff, hey, who could maybe possibly, you know, maybe he's going to dip, maybe his perceived value is going to dip, and then I can capitalize on it later. That's another small strategy. I wouldn't say it works for every guy, um, but especially it does at the quarterback position. Guys that we're talking about, like Herbert, um, I think that he could definitely struggle. Maybe the rookie quarterbacks in that range too. Dak was another example of that from last year kind of struggled a little bit and then boom came out and he was a top five quarterback the last, I think it was last, uh, I want to say it was like the last 10, 11 weeks of the season. So those are the guys that really target and go after. So let's, let's tie it all together because you, you said um, you gave a specific example about um, Devin Singletary and you mm -hmm. had gotten sniped a little bit on Bucky Irving, a couple picks um, earlier, uh, like three or four picks earlier. So write that down as well, right? You're talking yeah. about identifying players who may struggle out of the box. But if you believe in a certain player and you get sniped two or three picks um, ahead of where you planned on taking that player, write that down as your potential oh, yeah. target to go after. Because if if he struggles, doesn't get much playing time, gets injured in the preseason and spends the first couple games, you know, either on IR or that you may have an opportunity now to flip those players based on or, you know, or even offer something else, but just based on the slow start. So I always like to identify players I got sniped on, not publicly in the chat, like you said, so that no one has has that in-depth understanding that I want that player. But if I make the notation, now I know who to target in that first trade window. We talked about that too, right? So you have trade windows every season. Usually a lot of managers start off and they give it four weeks to see exactly how their players are going to play out. But that fourth to fifth week transition is a huge yeah. transactional window. And if you've got players that you wrote down is that you wanted to target in a startup and you got sniped and they didn't produce the first four weeks, well, now's your opportunity. If you still believe in that player to go and make an offer and go get them. Yeah, hundred percent. And then also as we move into the second, you know, slide here, we're going to be talking, look at the next five rounds uh, or four rounds, whatever it is. Understand too, the whole point of putting these things up there and looking through ADP is where you can trade ahead of some guys. If you want to get in this tier, you need to go get this guy. Okay, how do I go get this guy? All right, where do I need to kind of go? We did that a couple of times. We looked at JSN in our in our startup, and we said we wanted JSN. We're one of those guys. We don't believe JSN's terrible like everybody else does. And we were watching JSN kind of slip, 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 and he slipped into the back end of the fifth. But we looked at this ADP, and we're like, man, I don't know if JSN's going to get it back to us. We were on the back end of the next round, and we kind of said, okay, we need to go target this pick. You know, what does these guys want? We went through all the kind of areas of like, hey, you know, what do they look, you know, what do they need? What do they kind of, how do they draft? What are they doing here? And we were able to, you know, go get him. And because of this, we use this ADP right here that you're seeing. Um, it's dynasty data, dynasty data lab.com. Um, it's a perfect example for that. So go target these guys, get ahead of those tier breaks and kind of go through it. Um, as you're looking at the next rounds, as we're going through here a little bit, and, and you know, we're not going to go through every single one. You can drop your trade questions in the chat um, if you're watching this live. I know I have a couple in there already. Uh, we will answer those towards the end. We got some general advice stuff we're going to talk about after we go through this. Um, so if you have any questions in terms of Dynasty or maybe how the free agency has played out, you can drop them in there. We'll get to them. Um, when you're looking at the next four rounds here, uh, you know, 107, you know, is kind of is Roma Dunze right now. That's the ADP as as far as rookie ADP goes um, in March, which is always a it's always a questionable thing. Um, 108 is Brian Thomas Jr. 109 is JJ. Uh, Troy Franklin at 110. 111 Xavier Worthy. 112 Lad McConkey. Now that might change a little bit because the Chiefs went out and got Marquise Brown. Maybe they're not in the mold for a wide receiver. I think most thought Xavier Worthy was going to go there. But you do see a tier in the rookies. So you really have those first six guys. Rome is kind of the outlier. He's kind of going like the 107s in the fifth round. So you're looking at Rome being your wide receiver two slash three, possibly, depending on build. So that's how the rookies are kind of playing out here. I think really what this area does, the tiers, and like I always talk in pockets, 
a lot of running backs in this range. So you're looking at those second tier running backs that you're probably, if you're going zero running back or anchor running back later, this is where you're going to identify some of those guys like Saquon Barkley, Rashad White, Kenneth Walker, possibly Josh Jacobs. Now that he's got a new home, um, Swift. Now that he's got a new home, right? Those type of guys are going in this range, all different tiers, obviously in rounds. But to me, this is really the money round for tight ends and running backs. What you're seeing. Cause a lot of the wide receivers go. So that's the other thing. If you're going to wait on wide receiver, you're really looking at some of these wide receivers being your wide receiver two or possibly one like a T Higgins. And you might not be comfortable with that. Then you need to go get a wide receiver early. Yeah, this for me, this is where the 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 rookie value has a split in it because okay. if if I'm drafting if I'm drafting specific rookies, it's a little different. But if I'm drafting draft slots for a rookie draft, well, it just changes the value because yeah. I have I may be more aggressive to go get a Dunze, but if I'm going to miss out on him because I. I'm looking to draft the one eight and he goes one seven. Yeah. I may not pull the trigger quite so much as if I'm picking the actual player, you know? So, so, cause there's a big difference between drafting, you know, getting Odunze say at one eight or get it, having to go with, you know, uh, Xavier worthy at yeah. one nine, because all there was a run on wide receivers in that, in that rookie draft. So there's, there's a little bit of variance there for me. So I would prefer to pick the player over the draft slot, but I would be more cautious with the draft slot. Uh, The other thing, the other thing I think that's going to change here over the course of the next couple of weeks is I think you're going to see movement on some tight ends. I think Kyle Pitts with the news of Kirk cousins in Atlanta, I think you're going to see him move up at least around um, because I think there's going to be a lot of heat, a lot of talk over the course of the next month about just you know what that offense could potentially look like and i think tj hawkinson depending on what minnesota does could fall a little bit based on the quarterback position so i think we'll see a little bit of tight end movement there but for me in this in this pocket right here i'm generally going to lean a little bit more towards the established young player that i've seen on the field already as opposed to maybe you know going for a rookie pick in this range. Mm-hmm. hundred percent. I think that this, this range, there's so much uncertainty with the 107 and 112 and who it's going to be like, even if Rome, like whatever you want to say, like where he gets his landing spot. Cause he might go to the giants. I don't know about you, but like, that is not my ideal spot for a wide receiver. I mean, I know the target's going to be there, but you know where, I mean, Drew Locke, I got a small, I got a small, heart still thing for Drew Lock. I got Drew Lock. <laughs> right, we're, we're still hanging together. Me and him, ever since he uh he rapped young Jeezy, me and Drew Lock have been friends. Um, but I, I think that there is some, you know, you gotta be quick. What you said is right. You know, what I put on the screen, if you're watching, is like what their perceived ADP is. That's not who they draft based on this ADP tool that we have. That's just the picks in there. Um, so that's generally I think the first six picks, yes, those are generally speaking, like who's probably gonna go there. We don't usually see a lot of change there. Um mm-hmm. But now, yeah, you're getting that 1-7 and 112 range. So much can happen. So much change can kind of happen in there. Um, the guy I'm interested to hear your thoughts on, because, I, again, I, I'm, I'm kind of pivoting a little bit um, in terms of, like, what, how we're kind of addressing this. So these running backs, I think Josh Jacobs is probably going to get a bump. He's going seventh round now. He'll probably go in that five or six round now because I think there was some uncertainty about where he's going. But Taji Spears, I think, is an interesting one. I think that he's one of those guys that we were talking about earlier because we've talked about Taji Spears, actually. You know, we, we've mm-hmm. kind of mentioned yep. him. We've, we've been on shows talking about him. You know, Tony Pollard going there now, so he got signed there. Um, I think Spears might be that guy you target late because I, I think his ADP is going to go down. I could see Spears going in that ninth round now, ninth to tenth round now. I love Tajay Spears at nine, ten round value rather than seventh round value, which he was going with here. And I do think that he might be the more talented guy to kind of take over the backfield. I like Pollard. I'm a Cowboy fan. I've watched Pollard. Um, I think it was very good one-two punch there. But I think Spears might be able to be the fantasy guy. He's going to earn those fantasy points, the red zone touches, those type of things. So now that's a player I'm really interested in, like, you know, I think I said you could. I, I, someone asked me, what would you send for him? 206 is where I really feel comfortable. I don't know if you get, I don't know if they take it, but 206 in that range is something I'm willing to give up for Tajay Spears. As per usual, we're in lockstep uh, on how we're viewing this. It just goes to show how quickly, you know, the, the value window can change 
in yeah. uh, in Dynasty because you're right. We were on a we were on a podcast not that long ago where we talked about Tajay being kind of. Uh, I think that, you know, fish insulated school of fish, all the dynasty folks were talking about what a great acquisition he would be and, and get him and look what this was going to be. And now Pollard signs there and all of a sudden he's, you know, lost value. So for me, the negative cuff matters. So when we talk about running backs and handcuffs, I always like a talented running back. That's the negative cuff that's perceived to be the lesser of the two values, but could easily step in and outperform the person that's viewed as running back one. And, and that happens quite a bit in the NFL where you get a talented understudy or a talented, you know, running back one B and everybody focuses on one, a one, a gets hurt. And all of a sudden now you've got a viable starter. I love what Tajay brings to the table. I would be comfortable. ease. I probably, I, I might even move the two, three or two, four for him based on how a lot of the rookie drafts and ADP are playing out. Because mm -hmm. I think that, you know, I like Pollard too. And I do think, you know, now that he'll have an entire off season to be healthy and come in and we, you know, having struggled so much last year, didn't look as fast as he normally did. Didn't seem to have the burst that he had when he was splitting time with Zeke. So wh what does that do for his value this year? Does that mean the coaching staff realizes that they, he needs to be in kind of a platoon, you know, where he's, where he's getting regular uh, breathing, you know, uh, time on the bench to have a, another running back come in or do they expect him to be a bell cow? I don't think so, especially not with Tajay there. So I'm buying and I'm, I'm looking to probably move, you know, like I said, two, three, two, four, see if I can get him. I love him in that nine, 10 range and uh, would definitely add him as a, you know, whether you're doing a productive struggle or whether you're looking to win now, I think he brings value. Yeah, no, hundred percent. I, I agree too. And that, and that value, that range there. Um, when we're going in the next few rounds, really the money rounds, we're probably going to stop here. I have more, but really when you're looking at this, you can go to the, you can go to the website, Dynasty Data Lab and you can see all their other ones. What we talk about a lot, what I really, really talk about, try to get as many picks as you can in the first 12 rounds. Like just try to get as many picks as you can. Cause when you're looking at the board, you know, you see that there's still talent, there's still value to be had in these guys. I think that if you, if you drafted in this range, so right now in the 10th round, he was going as running back 23, Joe Mixon got a new contract in Houston. That's a hell of a spot for him. And I think that if you drafted pre, um, I think if you bought Mixon the last two off seasons, you know, I was buying him last off season. You really hit on this guy because, you know, while he doesn't look great and the metrics don't necessarily show out, the guy's a very solid running back too. And now he's with the Texans where you saw what Singletary was able to do. He's going in that 10th round. I'm assuming to probably bump up a little bit. Maybe I, I think he'll go like ahead of like Brian Robinson and those guys because of the off season. So probably eight, ninth round, but he's still a guy that I would definitely target. Um, if you go in zero running back, I think he's a perfect guy, especially if you're doing a comp uh, competitive build and you're like going right out of the gate. Mixon's those guys. Like of the guys in this group that I feel comfortable going zero running back around, Mixon is definitely up there. I probably put him at running back one for zero running back just because he doesn't have really anybody to compete with. He's going to get the volume in that range. Um, and that's really where you're looking at. Definitely a tier break in tight ends in this spot. Um, you're really looking at like Musgrave, Fryermuth, Schultz in terms of this going to the 12th round. So not a ton of tight end talent in that range. Um, but definitely this is where the zero running backs are. All right, who are you targeting? Where are you going to go after them? And the veteran wide receivers, guys like Deontay Johnson in the 10th, Marquise Brown in the 11th, those type of guys. Yeah, I think those two um, definitely worth calling out. I think uh, Deontay Johnson is going to get uh, – regardless of how you think of Bryce Young and, and what that offense is going to look like, I think he's going to definitely get peppered with a lot of targets. Um, Marquise Brown probably is ADP is going to change over the course of the next couple of weeks to some degree being in that offense. Uh, one of the running backs that I, I'm really interested in in this range um, would be Austin Eckler. I, I'm kind of curious mm -hmm. to see, um, you know, he battled injuries right out of the gate this past season. I don't think he the version we saw, we may never see him be the, the dominant running back from a fantasy perspective that he was say two years ago. But I do think that what we saw last year really is an indicative of the player he is. And mm -hmm. I do think that he bounces back to some degree um, this coming season. And I really think 11th round value for his ability to be both a pass catcher and uh, a viable running back. Uh, I, I like that value at that particular mm -hmm. spot.
Yeah, hundred percent. And you and you have to look at it too from this perspective. They're definitely gonna whoever rookie quarterback they draft, they're gonna protect them. And you're gonna see a lot of targets to your running backs. I mean, and, and based on that room, Eckler's the guy, right? Like you're thinking who is in that right? Brian Robinson is is okay. He he has okay uh pass catch ability, serviceable, but Eckler could be that guy that steps up. And I think he's a value right now because people are pretty much leaving him for dead in terms of dynasty value. Now he's probably gonna be an aging vet off your roster like you're probably not if you go trade for him he's a declining asset unless he really takes off and then you can pivot off of him this year um but you know you never probably getting back what you put in but yeah i agree in terms of that the kind of that value where these guys are going um it is going to be interesting to see where some of these wide receivers bump up marquise brown going 11th he's going to get the chiefs bump so you, you're going to see marquise brown the eight nine range probably um in that area uh the quarterbacks are interesting in this range um, you know, Gino getting in that competition with Sam Howe, and everybody knows I'm a Gino Smith hater. I've not been a Gino Smith fan for two years. I just, I don't, I don't want him on any of my rosters. I don't have any Gino Smith. And part of that issue is I just don't think he had upside with new coaching staff. Like there's no way they're going to like, this was a clear sign. It was a weird deal that they made the, I think it was today, right? Uh, or yesterday, my days, my week has been a nightmare. Um, so trying to figure out like, you know, is Sam Howell going to be that next guy in that offense? I actually like Sam Howell in Grubb's offense probably more than Gino. I think he fits that system a lot better. Um, so like Gino's a do not draft for me. If you put him on that do not draft board, like that is not in the air. But some some fun QB threes that have QB two potential. I think Aaron Rodgers, that interesting guy in this range. Um, Russell Wilson, you might not love the guy, but you know, sitting there in round 11 in Superflex, that's the value. They just traded Pickett. Like those are the type of guys in this range that kind of catch my eye. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I think that for me, what it comes down to really is that the last slide you had up like uh, six, seven, eight was all about mm -hmm. the older wide receivers that bring you value, like the Mike Evans and and Cooper some Cow. of those guys. And yeah. this round to me, these these three, four rounds that we have on the slide now are really about um, the veteran running backs that you fill out your, you know, zero running back build with and, and mm -hmm. give you um, – you know, viable production for a year or two coming out of that. So um, I think, you know, we talked about breaking it down in tiers and selecting targets. I think you do the same thing with positions, right? Mm -hmm. Rounds one for four, this is what I'm looking for. Rounds, you know, five through seven, this is what the, where the value should fall. Mm -hmm. Rounds nine through 12, this is where the value should be there for those running backs. So just kind of having that roadmap for, for what you think is going to be available and then adjusting as it actually starts to play out. Yeah. And I do, I have that. I, I have it somewhere. I don't know. Um, I write way too much for football guys, but there is, there is an article out there that I did an uh, anchor running back strategy. And I actually break down like what I look for at each round. Now it changes a little bit. So I go and update it just based on like, you know, value and everything. But I'm like, mm -hmm. Hey, you need that quarterback. You need that running back. Now I think what happens is with anchor running back, is you don't I always put in there you really want to get that guy in the second round because they were still valuing running backs like that like hey that second round running back but now I think you could wait to maybe the fourth or fifth round and get an anchor running back however you want to call that you know just hey you grab these guys so there's definitely nuance to that but yeah understanding where those positions are is exactly what we're trying to help you guys with in terms of that now you know I'll just for YouTube purposes and for you guys viewing you know I, I'm going to show you these rounds I'm not going to talk about a lot of these guys um, but 13th through 16th round they have them you're definitely looking at a lot of the rookies, some other guys like Singletary. That's the other thing, Devin Singletary, just for context, what I was talking about, he was going to the 15th round of this. We got him in like the 17th round. So there's value kind of even in these later picks when you're going through them, 17th to 20th. They go all, so this one goes all the way from, you know, round one to 25. So you could get a good idea of where some of these guys are going. And as they get new data, the nice thing about Dynasty Data Lab that I, I know that when people talk about it, these are all leagues that are done for that specific, you know, data set for ADP. So what happens in sleeper when like their ADP, the crazy leagues out there, the tight end premium and all that stuff, it's all mixed. So you have to understand that that stuff gets mixed together. What he has done, and you can really filter it down to all kinds of different values. You can filter it down to basically, yeah, third round reversal. He has third round reversal ADP. He has all his different values. So you know these are the drafts that have been drafted. And it's not like that craziness of that you see out there in terms of like just ADP backs it down. Now, I love MFL. Um, the ADP that, you know, Ryan McDowell does and all that kind of stuff is still great. Um, but I do just think this is a fun tool. It's just new shiny that's that's just how it works in the space that they see here but i used it it's, it's good and it honestly 
I, me using it has, has been one of my, it's been one of my favorite tools, the like teams that I built um, with my co-manager that we built. So I know it works because we've been using it. I was like, ah, oh, damn, I like this team just based on how it looks at. Yeah, I think it's a great tool. I think it's a great visual, right? Everybody kind of learns differently. Some folks like a, a visual ADP like that. Some people want a, a grid or just a ranking system. I think that's phenomenal because of the, uh, again, the visual uh, excellence with the different colors by positions. And and it just it just looks good and, and it's mm -hmm. easy to decipher. And, and uh, it's a great tool to help you walk through um, the steps that we talked about at the beginning of this podcast. Yeah, a hundred percent. All right. So we got some time. We got about 10 minutes. Uh, I know uh, Leo wanted to talk about kind of some general advice stuff. I'll let him kind of go on his, 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 his journey that he wants to take you on in terms of like how you're tracking people advice and all that kind of stuff. But I know we have over, you know, a bunch of people watching right now. If you do have some questions, you have trade questions, you can drop them in there. Um, I do want to get to this real quick before we kind of dive into that stuff. Um, uh, see, he jumped on, you know, like, I don't know his at name, but you know, it's Twitter, uh, one Oh nine before or after Mike Evans. So essentially what are you paying for Mike Evans? It really comes down to where I think JJ McCarthy is probably going to be in super flex to me. Um, so like, especially that quarterback position, you know, part of me really does feel like, you know, if it's, if JJ goes at one Oh eight, you're still looking at Brian Thomas at one Oh nine and where that value is at, um, 109 for Mike Evans on a contender is something I'm okay giving up. I'm I'm okay giving that up. Um, if it if it's that piece is gonna put me over the top, I'm okay with that. I will I will do that. I'm more comfortable at 110 to 112. That's probably where my range is at, though. I like to keep that 109 be pre-draft just based on what we don't know with JJ McCarthy and some of those guys. Um, but that's essentially where I'm at with Mike Evans. But I have to have a win now squad where I'm ready to go. Yeah, I agree. I think we always talk about being draft, draft active and it's nice to have the one nine in pocket so that you can make adjustments based on value that falls during a rookie draft. But if bottom line, if I'm, if I'm wide receiver deprived on my, on a team that is really ready to make a championship run, then I'm willing yeah. to pay that to get Mike Evans. If, if, you know, I'm looking at a, a one or two year window of really making a serious title run. And that's the difference maker for me. I'd rather have Mike Evans in that scenario. Yeah. hundred percent. All right, Leo. Uh, oh, wait, we got one. I like this. Is there a bad destination for Marvin Harrison jr.? Or what's the worst landing spot for him in fantasy? Uh, Leo, Leo's going to get mad. In New, England. New England. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't disagree. I mean, uh, just based on their track record with how they've, uh, they haven't, it's not only that they've swung and missed, and I know it's a new regime and it's, you know, new coaching staff, but they've swung and their history has just been so bad at swinging and missing at wide receivers. And not just that, they haven't developed any. So, uh, granted, new coaching staff, but I need to see it before I believe it, and I need to understand what the quarterback situation is. So that's where I'd prefer that he didn't go. Yeah, yeah, I, you know, you're you're a New England fan. You're a New England fan, right? Yeah, you're. Uh, well, I'm in New England. I don't necessarily, you know, I mean, I'm. <laughs> I'm I, my son is a huge New England Patriot fan, so I don't disparage them simply because okay. I don't want his ire. I think my biggest problem with what they did is they just kind of rehashed the Belichick regime, yeah. like with Mayo and those guys and their offensive staff and everything that they brought in doesn't excite me as like a fantasy manager for Marvin Harrison Jr. Like that being his location. I do think that they, I think they trade out of that pick. I think that if they do, if they like, they don't like the quarterbacks, they really want to get that capital. The Vikings move up all those things that could happen. Um, then, oh, okay. I'd be great. Cause I know Marvin Harrison Jr. is not going to new England because I, I don't want him there. Um, now yeah. selfishly, I tweeted out something like in November of laughing about what is going to happen with the dynasty community when he goes to new England. So I kind of want it to happen just so I can laugh about it. Um, but like, I, you know, for me, that's it. If I had to rank them, like the teams in the top 10 where I wouldn't want to see them go, probably, you know, Tennessee probably took themselves out. They're probably going to go offensive line. I don't love the Giants spot either, like because of that same issue with the quarterback position there. Um, but, you know, I would, you know, Cardinals, again, it'll be interesting to see kind of what they do. The Chargers, I would, Herbert and, the, and, and Marvin Harrison Jr. together would be awesome I, I would love then we're gonna not have our herbert bump or drop anymore with marvin harrison jr True. Uh, but as far as worst landing spot uh get me out of new england don't let him go well, to new england 
And I think you're right. I think, you know, when I talk about them having not developed wide receivers in the past, there's been no page turn for me. You know, you, you're right about the, the the whole new coaching staff and turning it over to Mayo just feels more like Belichick Jr. is what it feels yeah. like. And until I see a clear line of delineation between how they approach things, which I haven't seen yet, I kind of just feel like it's going to be more of the same. It's kind of like prove me wrong because this is, you know, right, wrong, or indifferent. That's kind of how I view it. Yeah, no, hundred percent. I, I just, you know, it just, ugh, don't go there. Don't go, don't, don't go to more new England Patriots there. Uh, so again, as you guys are watching, do you have any questions, anything football related works for me too. I'm, I, I love football more than I love fantasy. So you draw some football questions. We'll, we'll, we'll get to them. Um, we'll answer them the best of our ability. But I do want to ask you in terms of this, because you did put in there like, hey, you know, what do you look for? There's there's a lot of social media stuff, especially now that free agency has gone. Everybody has a take. Everybody's got a take on this, on this, on this, on this. Um, and, you know, the takes that I probably dislike the most is like, not the, really the clickbait. Because every take is clickbait. That's fine. That's what it is. That's just generally what it is. Um, I think the 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 takes that I I hate seeing the one and I play in a lot of leagues with fantasy guys. I see them like say a take, but then I don't see them actually do it in their leagues. So like they'll like, oh, so and so is my tight end too. And then you and then you look at their roster and you try to trade him and he's like, oh, I don't want him. I don't value him at that. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Use that he's tied into on Twitter. Why aren't you valuing that in the league? So like, I do think there's some, you know, but normal fantasy people aren't going to see that because um, they don't play in leagues with these guys too. So it is overwhelming, I think, with the, all the information on social media time. So how do you navigate it? What do you try to do and look for? So the two pieces of advice, and I think this time of year, it's kind of critical to have this lens is that first of all, you don't need to have a take on every single player in the yeah. league or every single transaction that took place. And I think if you're following folks that have to weigh in on everything, um, I think that's a warning sign. I mean, I get it. I understand engagement's king and you're trying to get out there, and, and but you really don't need a take on everything. The other thing I don't like this time of year are is anybody who speaks in absolutes. There are no, I mean, we talked about it with Tajay Spears. There are no, if you were banging the table on, on, you're banging the table for him three, four weeks ago, and now you're not, I get it. Things change, but you don't need, you need to take that into consideration whenever you have a take and explain it and be able to talk to it and how it's changed. But you get people who talk in absolutes all the time about every player. So those are, those are the two things I would really say to be careful about. Just kind of watch and, and use a discerning eye for folks who have to have a take on everything. And then folks who speak in absolutes in March, because it's a little ridiculous. So kind of digest the tone and understand what you're getting and gravitate towards the folks that have a rational eye and are willing to discuss and debate, because I think that's important. Yeah. I think what you said is, is really, really important. Um, and I do this now. I was kind of bad at it before, but just understanding just you don't have to have a take on every player. When I first started, I, I, I wanted to have a take on every player because you kind of get out there and doing those things. You know what's been great for me this offseason and last offseason? I don't have a Justin Fields take. I have no Justin Fields take. For me, I liked him in fantasy because he ran a lot. If I could get him for that, that's fine. For Dynasty, I had no shares because I was concerned about his long-term outcomes as a quarterback. But I don't hate Justin Fields. I just was a player for me. I was like, yeah, not comfortable with that. It's not really a take. I wasn't out there saying to buy, sell, all these craziness. And that has helped out my blood pressure. And that has helped out like my stress level because a lot of people get upset about Justin Fields right now. You see that take, you can do that. I think quarterbacks are probably the one the one position that probably gets the most right like that i think is the is the big one um in terms of that and i love that we have a quarterback question we could segue into this from andy uh what do we think of the sam how i love it i like that I, for sam how to go to that offense i mean he was not going to do anything in washington and i don't like kingsbury's offense anyway so for him to go to grubs and them to give up the capital that he did i know they flipped it and whatever i think that's a positive sign i don't think gino's the guy I still think Howe is a fun grab, and he could he could produce a lot of fantasy points in that offense. Like that, if you're talking about a fantasy perspective, yes. I think from a NFL 
player projection, the their ability to spread it out wide, the three wide receiver sets in Grubb's offense, the quick reads, Michael Penix Jr. really excelled there. How struggles with the reads, like that's one thing that he does struggle with. He holds a little bit too long, those type of things. If they can just work him in offense where he's just using his physical tools, how can be a quarterback that's serviceable? Now, you ever going to win a Super Bowl, Sam Howe? I don't know, probably not, but he could be a serviceable, good quarterback. And I think that's what should excite you about that situation. Yeah, I also think the improvement in the offensive line is a big deal yeah. too because he took such a beating last season with all the sacks. And I think him being able to be upright a little bit longer and not, not have to run for his life on almost every pass play will make a difference for him. And good coaching matters. And I think in this particular instance, he'll get the guidance that he needs and the weapons that are available. I think it is a really good fit for him. Yeah, no, hundred percent. I, I do too. Um, what do you do with Stidham, Darnold, and Brissett? Current starters, Dash, and Superflex for, for a third while I can. Uh, well, Stidham is I, – if I could flip something for Stidham, I'd probably do that. I've never been a big guy on Stidham. Um, Brissett, I kind of feel the same way about Brissett. I'm not like a huge, you know, Brissett guy either. I would hold though till the draft because if they don't draft a quarterback, his value is going to shoot up. So like I would hold him. Um, Darnold, uh, I don't know. I, I think that if you can get a second for Darnold, I, I'd be comfortable with that. Again, it really just depends on the Vikings. So that's the thing. Like they don't draft the guy, you know, he's his value is going to shoot up. They draft a guy, you're not getting even a third for Darnold. So like that's where the question mark comes into it. Really, who do you believe in? To me, like if I can get something for Brissett and Stidham, I'm doing that probably. If I can, if I can get a second for Brissett, I would. If I can't, I'd wait till the New England because I think that's the one team that might not draft a quarterback. Darnold, I'm going to hold because I'm a Darnold truther, and I think that he might. If he can get out there and just play a little bit, you like that a little bit. Um, but a third is too light for me in Superflex. I, 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 I need something more. Yeah, Stidham is an easy trade for me pretty much regardless. And when it comes to Darnold and Brissett, I think Darnold's the most talented of the three. Uh, but you're right. What does Minnesota do? Uh, do they draft early? Brissett, I think, has a chance simply because of his ties with New England. And I yeah. think the fact that they think highly of him, and I have no confidence in New England going out and actually drafting the right quarterback keeping the pick. I think, you know, potentially they trade back and think that Brissett as a starter for this year is actually, um, you know, a viable plan. Brissett's worth a third and, you know, if you can get it, but again, I would probably hold him because I think he has the best chance to start. I think Minnesota does something quarterback wise in addition to Darnold and, uh, what does that end up looking like? Ultimately, if the, you told me these were your three backups in Superflex and, and you know, you could get a third for all three of them, uh, I don't have an issue with that. The only problem is they're your current starters. So you need to try to hedge your bet on one of them. It's just a question of whether you want to hedge your bet on who the most talented is, which I think would be Darnold, or who has the best chance to start, which is probably Brissett. <laughs> this comment made me laugh. I love this. Uh, the QBs, they don't, they should enforce. They don't value QBs. Unfortunately, and I don't believe in any, they get them off your roster, sir. Like if you don't, if you don't believe, if you don't believe in those guys, which I totally get, like if you, if you're looking at it and they don't value it anyway, it, it, and I think he said it, they, they're starters right now in the league. That's why they're stashed. I don't think. They're oh, I, uh, I misunderstood. Okay. My so bad. If that's the case, Sometimes that if that, happens. If, that, if that's the case, get a third, yeah. get a Flip third. Them. That's fine. I mean, you can re-roll and just get those third picks and go through. I would try to flip two of them. I, you know, for me, Brissett is the guy that's interesting because I do think if New England doesn't draft a quarterback, he could be the starter. And he's that bridge guy. That's the, that is the one guy that I think you might be able to strike a little bit more volume out of um, and value out of there. Um, all right. If you have more questions, you can drop them real quick. But I think we're done tonight if, if no one's got more questions. I thought this was a good show. I think breaking down kind of the ADP, where it looks at, how you kind of navigate your 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 league in terms of where that value is at. Um, and that that's good. Any other final thoughts, Leo, before we get out of here? No, I think we're good. I think uh, the only thing I'll mention is that my first article for Football yeah. Guys dropped uh, this week. So if you're interested at all, it covered basically some uh, life hacks for making trades 
in uh, in Whoop Dynasty or Redraft League. So if you're interested, check it out. It's up on the site of Football Guys now. I'm such a terrible um, co-host. You're not. It's mention. fine. We're I forgot to mention brother. that. Uh, Leo Leo's at Football Guys now. So go check his stuff out. I think that it's a it's a really cool um, thing for him to be over there. Uh, with us, you know, he's the OG of Dynasty, but I, I do it. I did enjoy the article 11 life hacks to improve your trading skills. Again, just context, context, context. How do you trade? What do you do? Um, make sure that you dive into that and you really kind of, um, you move forward there and you, and you, and you look at how he does that. So you can get all his, you know, his verbal skills out there into his writing and going through it. Um, I really love the, my soapbox part. Um, that was a funny like area in there and it, you know, reading the room, uh, a miss and the biggest thing is, and we'll leave you with this, a miss doesn't mean it's a failure. So like, just cause we have misses, that doesn't mean you're a failure. You know, we all have misses out there. Um, we can laugh about them, but you just got to learn from them. That's just part of life. That's just a big thing. So uh, we appreciate you guys. We'll be back in a couple of weeks. Uh, we're getting close. We're getting close to the draft. Finally, we need more content out here. So uh, we'll be diving into some other stuff in a couple of weeks. Appreciate you guys. Thank you.